Okay, so last time we solved ODEs, uh, and we did that using the fixed point theorem applied to a contraction mapping from a space of functions, uh, the space of functions being between two intervals, i and j. And there was an observation which I made at the end of the lecture, which is where we're going to pick up the thread now. And the observation was that, um, you know, at least when the differential equation was polynomial, that is to say that the right-hand side, the other side from the ddx phi, phi is the unknown function, if the other side was actually a polynomial function in the independent variable and the unknown function. Uh, then we observe that in the iteration, because we're integrating polynomials iteratively, uh, all the things we're constructing in the iteration, if we start with a constant function, which we may, will be polynomials. So that actually we don't just find a sequence of functions converging to the solution. Uh, that is not a sequence of arbitrary functions, it's a sequence of polynomial functions. Right. So we find as a side effect that at least for polynomial DEs, the solutions can always be approximated arbitrarily well by polynomials. And the sense in which they're approximated arbitrarily well is the uh, D infinity metric. Right? So uh, we call that uniform approximation, right? Because D infinity distance is uniform convergence. So if you've got um, a function and for every epsilon, there's something within distance epsilon with respect to the D infinity metric, uh, which belongs to a special class, say polynomials. Then you say that polynomials uh, uniformly approximate arbitrary functions. Now, that would clearly be really useful if it was always true, right? If you could approximate any continuous function by polynomials, that would be great. Well, why would it be great? Well, who knows what to do with a generic real number, right? You know what to do with integers. You can handle integers and you can handle rational numbers. So your whole ability to work with real numbers is predicated on the fact that every real number is a Cauchy sequence of rational numbers and you understand rational numbers, right? I mean, if you think about e or pi or whatever, when have you ever calculated e or pi or done anything with it? You've written down a limit expression which computes e or you've got some series which computes pi. That's how, I mean, how else would you figure out the millionth decimal place of pi? Not that you necessarily care about that. Um, okay, so this is a fundamental fact to our ability to work with real numbers, and a similar observation applies to spaces of functions. Right, so if I just give you a space x, I mean, you might ask more generally about the space of functions from x to y for x and y arbitrary. I mean, that's sort of a hard problem to think about. Uh, but a slightly easier problem, it's still very useful, is to consider the space of functions into R, so real valued functions on x. And you might ask, well, I mean, you could be ambitious and ask, well, what are all the continuous functions defined on my space x? I mean. Maybe you don't even know a single interesting one, right? So you, there's a set, it's got a topology, but maybe you don't know anything in there. You don't know anything about the continuous functions. So could you try and classify them? Could you figure out what all the continuous functions are presented in terms of something simple which you can understand in the same way that all real numbers can be presented as limits of rational numbers and you understand rational numbers? Okay, so the point is that you can do that. Uh, and polynomial functions give the appropriate class of simple functions. At least when I mean, there's various generalizations we'll discuss, but this is already pretty interesting, I'd say. So as soon as you have a compact subset of Rn, every continuous function defined on x can be approximated in the same sense I just described, that is with respect to the d infinity metric, arbitrarily closely by a polynomial. Right, so that's awesome, right? So any, any quantity which is computed in a continuous way from a function, for example, its integral, can be computed by doing integrals of polynomial functions, which you can handle, right? So, I mean, we've discussed many operations, say composition, uh, which are continuous functions of a function. And 
since this says that any such thing is a limit of a sequence of polynomials, you can just restrict to dealing with polynomials. All right. So that's what we're going to prove. Uh, so the case n equals 1 is uh, due to Weierstrass from 1885. Uh, so we're going to start with a proof of that, and then we'll do a generalization. So we'll discuss this generalization, first of all, to compact subsets of Rn, and then there's an even more general statement, which is the stone weierstrass theorem. Uh, OK. Um, so the first part, the Weierstrass theorem, is sort of very elementary. So we'll just do it by hand. We're going to actually construct polynomials that do the approximation. So let me state the theorem. As usual, if I say a sequence in this space converges to f, I have in mind with respect to the d infinity metric. I won't keep repeating that. Right now, you know some facts of that kind already, right? That's sort of what Taylor series are up to. Uh, but there's limitations to Taylor series, right? They don't always converge. Uh, So here, we're not going to take the Taylor series of f. I mean, that doesn't even make sense, because f isn't differentiable. So Taylor series work if f is a very nice function, right? If it's infinitely differentiable, then you can try and use Taylor series. I'm not requiring anything like that. f is continuous. It doesn't have to be differentiable. For instance, the polynomial sequence which approximates the absolute value function will be very crucial in what we're going to do in a minute. OK, so how do we go about doing this approximation? OK, so start with any function. I'm not even going to assume it's continuous. And well, let's assume it's defined on 0, 1. I guess you can believe I can reduce to the case 0, 1 here. That's what we'll do in a minute. So let's just start with a function defined on 0, 1. OK, and I'm going to define a polynomial for n greater than or equal to 1. might justifiably say, well, why the hell would you think to write that down? <laughs> yeah, to be honest, I don't have a very good answer to that. I mean, it arises originally in the context of probability. So this is to do with the Bernoulli distribution, right? But I don't quite, uh, haven't quite looked into the origin of it. We'll see that it works. Um, OK, so I hope, well, we believe that makes sense, right? k on n is between 0 and 1, so that's some number. And then I put in the binomial coefficient, and OK, so that's a polynomial. <coughs> All right. So some immediate observations from the expression uh, is that, well, it's linear. Because it only depends on f in terms of this coefficient. So if I take f plus g, then I'll just get the sum of the two Bernoulli polynomials. And similarly, if I multiply by a scalar, all right. OK, so let's compute the first. Well, that means that. You know, for instance, we might try and compute the Bernoulli polynomials of polynomials, right? 
that is of 1 of, let's say, z. Uh, so Now, there's a bit of potential for confusion because, okay, there's a variable x, which is the sort of formal variable in the polynomial, if you like, to think about it as a formal polynomial. Uh, but I'm putting in a function f, right, which I'm then evaluating at various points of the unit interval. And I'm going to use z to be the function, the variable which defines, which is in the function f, so to speak, so as to distinguish it from the x. Okay, I hope that's clear. So this is putting in the function f of z equals z. This is putting in the function f of z equals z squared. All right, so we'll check in a sec. That's 1. That's not z, right, because this is a polynomial in x. So what I get out has got to be something in x. And that is <laughs> not so obvious. All right, so we'll have to do this calculation. Okay, well this one, this one should be clear. Right? This is a standard sort of trick. Because what, what happens if I put in the function one? Well, I just get the binomial formula for x plus one minus x to the power n. So by the binomial formula, that's 1 plus 1 minus x to the power n, which is 1 to the n, which is 1. OK, so that's the easy one. Uh, well, maybe I should foreshadow what the point of these polynomials is. So we're going to prove in a second that if f is continuous, OK, so what's the point? The point is that bnf will converge to f as n goes to infinity as long as f is continuous. Okay, so this will be the sequence of polynomials. Uh, oh, thank you, yeah. Okay, so that's what these polynomials are for. And actually, this third calculation here is the only tricky part in the whole business, and it's not, not that tricky. Okay, so let's do, let's do the second identity there. So consider this polynomial in two variables. Um, I'm going to compute its partial derivative with respect to x in two ways. Well, the first way is to observe that, well, that's the binomial formula, again, for x plus y to the n. And by the chain rule, that's n x plus y to the n minus 1. Okay, but I could have also computed that by using linearity of the derivative and just taking it inside and hitting the x to the k, right? Okay, so one calculation gives you that. The other calculation gives you k x to the k minus 1, y to the n minus k. All right, so those two things are equal. as polynomials, right? And I can multiply both sides by x on n. So that gives me x plus y and x. Um, OK, so then I've got a k on n, and that x is fixed back up be that there. Right, so that's 
an identity of polynomials. Okay, and substituting, I mean, that's true for all, I mean, it's an identity of polynomials, as I keep saying. So substituting y equals 1 on x gives me another identity on polynomials of x, and it's uh, exactly x equals So there's the magic trick. That's B in of Z, right? And then we just do it again. So we just differentiate this formula with respect to X on both sides, and we'll do, and that'll give us that last identity. Okay, so we're differentiating. Star. Star. Respect to x gives us x plus y to the n minus 1 plus n minus 1 x x plus y to the n minus 2. Um, n is only greater than or equal to 1, so you know the usual convention, this is 0 if n is equal to 1. Okay, so it's the left hand side and the right hand side again, take the derivative in and hit the x to the k. squared, x to the k minus 1, y to the n minus k. Right? So I just differentiated both sides with respect to x. And now again, multiply both sides by x on n. plus y to the n minus 1 plus n minus 1 on n x squared. Um, in case you're looking for this in the notes, yeah, so the, <laughs> the version of the notes I put up, I was doing the, in the end I decided to do the classical version first because this is kind of neat and very bare hands. Uh, so. The, the node starts at the more abstract level, which will, so we'll use this to prove the more abstract theorem. There's some point where you have to do a calculation, and I figured it might as well be here. Uh, right, so that was, that was dividing the left-hand side by x on n, and dividing the, sorry, multiplying by x on n, x on n, and the right-hand side gives us Again, setting y equal to 1 minus x. This is just x on n. That's just n minus 1 on x squared. And this over here is precisely so. uh, precisely bn of z squared. Questions about that part? Yeah. I'll show you. Other questions? Okay. So proof of the theorem. What was the theorem? That said that given a function which was continuous on AB, I can approximate it arbitrarily closely by a polynomial with respect to D infinity. And as I said, I'm going to prove it uh, in the case where AB is the unit interval, then it's just an easy 
extension to get to the general case. All right, so what are we given? We're given a continuous function So we need one more input besides the Bernstein polynomials for this argument, and that's that a continuous function on a compact metric space is uh, uniformly continuous. So uh, I'll give you the statement more precisely. Okay, so to say that's uniformly continuous is to say that for all epsilon there exists a delta not depending on the point in the domain such that okay such that if x and y are within a distance delta then the images are within a distance epsilon All right continuity is per point Right, you choose the delta after you're told the point. Uniform continuity says you can do it uh, consistently or uniformly for all x. Now, the fact that continuous function on a compact metric space is uniformly continuous, I think I mentioned it, uh, but we haven't proven it. I've put it in the notes as an exercise. Uh, it really isn't, I mean, it's the same sort of argument we were doing over and over again in the context of compactness. So have a shot at that. I'll supply a solution at some point. Um, okay, so we're going to use it in any case. So we use that f is uniformly continuous. All right, so what are we trying to do? Well, we're given f and we're given an epsilon. We need to find a polynomial that's within a distance epsilon of f, right? And well, we're given the epsilon, so we take a delta. Uh, possibly I want epsilon on two. Who knows? Let's see. Yeah, I do. All right. All right, so this is the epsilon we want to use to get something within distance epsilon of f, but I'm going to put the epsilon on 2 into the uniform continuity to produce the delta. All right. Well, right, f is continuous on a compact space, so its image is a bounded subset of R. Let's say m is the bound. All right, so m and delta are the two numbers we've produced. Okay, so. Is the claim. <laughs> yeah. All right. So why is that? Well, I mean, it's it's actually pretty straightforward. Look, if x and y within it were within a distance delta of one another, then we could use that to see that the left-hand side is less than the epsilon on 2, and we're done. If it's not within a distance delta, then we know that this is kind of large relative to delta. But it can't be too large because f is bounded, so we get this bound. So if this is less than delta, use that part. If it's greater than delta, use that part. That's the idea. So I'll not go through that in more detail now. So. Uh, so if x minus y is less than delta, then fx minus s fy is less than epsilon on 2, and therefore less than or equal to that stuff. Right. Okay, otherwise, so if, if x minus y is greater than or equal to delta, Say. <coughs> yeah. So. All right. Well, 
that's true, just by the bound, right? And then I just read this as a 1, so that's less than 2m times x minus y delta squared, which is less than that. Okay, so either way, I'm, I'm set with that bound. All right, so that's the proof of the claim. Okay, so now we're going to start playing with the Bernstein polynomials. Well, so what are we, what are we going to do? Dot, 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 d infinity, b and f, f is less than epsilon. <laughs> Right. Uh, for n sufficiently large, so that's the what we're doing now is trying to figure out how what sufficiently large means, right? Okay. So, well, what is this going to look like? That's the supremum of things that look like b n f applied to some point, and I'm going to call it x zero. Just to emphasize that it's really a constant rather than a variable in the polynomial, okay? So that's what that distance is. It's the supremum of all those absolute values. Okay, so I need to understand these kinds of differences, right? So that's the game now. And to understand that, I, I might as well just fix the x0, okay? So this is a fixed point. And I'm going to look at the Bernstein polynomial of this function. Okay, so that's f minus the constant f of x0. Well, I mean, that's, we discussed the linearity, so that's b in f minus f of x0, which is just a constant times b in 1, and I know b in 1 is 1, so that's b in f minus f x0. Okay. I mean, if you were thinking about BNF as a formal polynomial before, now start thinking about it as a polynomial function on 0, 1. Yeah. Okay, so well, that's the thing we've got to estimate the size of, right? So that's the absolute value of BNF minus FX0. Now, here's the slight mental gymnastics you have to undergo. Uh, this thing here is a function, right? It's not a number. That part's a number, but that's still got an independent variable in it. So that's a function of, well, x, the way I was writing it. So that's a function of x. Eventually, I'm going to evaluate it at x0, because that's the number I care about. For the intermediate parts, I don't want to do that. Okay. So this is really a function of a number x, which lies in 0, 1. All right, I'm taking its absolute value. So that's uh, equal to, by that calculation, the absolute value of bn f minus fx0. Uh, I've erased the definition. All right. I just want to put up the definition of the Bernstein polynomial again for a second. Okay, well, look at that, and keep in mind that I'm evaluating it at numbers x, which are positive. I mean, they lie in 0, 1. So if the function f is always less than or equal to some other function g, then bnf is always less than or equal to bng, right? Because I'm only, these numbers, I'm just changing those parts, right? In particular, the absolute value of bnf, which is the absolute value of that sum, is less than or equal to the, abs the sum of the absolute values. And all those things are positive. So if I take the absolute value of each sum n, I'm just taking the absolute value of that. Okay. So that is to say that I get less than or equal to bn of the function, which is this. Right. This is the function which assigns to x in 0, 1 the value 
fx minus fx0 absolute value. Okay, so now I can use this. Right? So this is a function, this bit here. So that's a function on 0, 1. Let me take another function on 0, 1. I might as well just edit it. Okay, so let me take the function on 0, 1, which is reading this formula but with an x0 there. That's a fixed number. That's varying, so that's a function on 0, 1. And that tells me that function is less than or equal to, that is, it's majorized by the function where that is x0. Okay, that's also a function of x. Delta m and epsilon are fixed. Okay, so that function of x is less than or equal to that function of x. And therefore, that Bernstein polynomial, its values are always less than or equal to the values of putting in that thing on the right-hand side. So that's 2m x minus x0 on delta squared plus epsilon on 2. All right, well, that's a constant. That's a constant, so I might as well take them outside. So that's 2m bn of, well, I can take the delta squared outside as well. And then that's bn of x minus x0 squared plus epsilon on 2. Well, bn of 1, but that's just 1. OK, so that's 2m delta squared bn of x squared minus 2x is 0. OK. Well, I know how to evaluate that kind of thing, right? Uh, well, I promised I was going to use z's as the input variable, didn't I? <laughs> so that didn't work out very well. <laughs> okay. In your head, this is also a z, right? <laughs> I hope you get the point. So this, these are numbers. That's the variable that I'm putting into the Bernstein polynomial. Uh, and then I know how to compute the Bernstein polynomial of a polynomial of degree 2, at least. So we can do that. All right. And what I get is 2m delta squared. So bn of x squared, or z squared, so that's n minus 1 on n, x squared plus 1 on n, x minus 2 times bn of z, which is x, so that x doesn't, nothing happens to it, so that's 2x x0. And then the x0 squared, well that's really times a 1, and that just gets me a 1. So I promise the voodoo is almost over. OK, so we just collect terms there. And then we'll have our bound. All right, so, so that's uh, n on n times x squared. So that's just an x squared. And then the minus 1 on x squared, I'll collect with the 1 on n x. So that's 1 on n x minus x squared minus 2x x0 plus x0 squared. OK. Now, what was that all together saying? It was saying the function, which is the absolute value of the Bernstein polynomial minus f of x0, which is a function of x, for any value of x, it's less than or equal to that expression there. Well, in particular, it's less than or equal to that expression there when I substitute x equals x0. Well, that 
goes away. And I'm left with 2m on delta squared n x0 minus x0 squared plus epsilon on 2. All right. But x0 was a point in 0, 1, right? And x0 minus x0 squared is just the parabola that meets the x-axis at 0 and 1. It has a maximum at a half. And its maximum value at a half is 1 quarter. So that's less than or equal to 1 quarter. I mean, the precise number doesn't matter. The whole point of that is to get rid of the x0 because I want to take a supremum, right? OK, so that's m on 2 delta squared n plus epsilon on 2. All right, so that's good news. So that says, I mean, that's true for every x0. So that tells me that the d infinity distance from the nth Bernstein, Bernstein polynomial to f, which is that, must be less than or equal to the right hand side. Well, to get it less than or equal to epsilon, I just have to make this less than or equal to epsilon. I can do that by making n large. Right? So we're done. Uh, okay, so I need to choose capital N such that, uh, let's see, what should it be? That's correct. So choose an integer greater than or equal to that thing. Then n greater than or equal to that gives me that uh, m on delta squared n is less than or equal to epsilon on 2. OK, and therefore, OK, so that's, so that's it. OK, so that's somewhat more than just knowing that it's approximated by polynomials. We've actually described the polynomials. Any questions about the proof? All right, so we're going to prove a more general version, uh, but maybe I'll just explain the crux of the matter uh, in the remaining few minutes. OK, so the idea now. So another way to state what we just proved is that if I take the set of polynomial functions from a, b to r, so that sits as a subset of the continuous functions from a, b to r. Let's call that a. Now everything in this space is a limit of a sequence which lies in this space, which is precisely to say that the closure of a is everything. A is dense. Right? So the 
theorem says polynomial functions are dense in that function space. So more generally, we can ask, given a space x, well, maybe it doesn't make sense to say polynomial functions, right? Polynomial functions are something that exists for subspaces of Rn, right? Because that's what polynomial functions are defined on Rn. But we could still perhaps identify some substitute, which is some subset of the space of functions, uh, with the property that its closure is everything. And that may play the role of the polynomials. Okay, so that's the idea. And the stone weierstrass theorem tells us exactly what conditions, well, it tells us one set of sufficient conditions on the subset A. Uh, namely, that it be closed under multiplication, addition, and scalar multiplication, which is true of polynomials. And that given two points of x, there's a function in A which takes different values on those two points, which is also true of polynomials. And then given those two conditions, the stone weierstrass theorem says uh, that we have this same result. OK, so I'll do that next lecture. But let me tell you the uh, kind of neat trick which goes into it, which is the following. So Okay, so suppose I had a compact space and a continuous function defined on it. Well, I can take the absolute value of that function, which is just to say take the absolute value of it point-wise, right? So then right, so just take your continuous function and post-compose with the absolute value function. I mean, that's continuous, and that's continuous, so the composite is continuous, and it's defined by sending x to the absolute value of fx. So it's continuous. Now, the absolute value is not a polynomial function, clearly. but it can be approximated by polynomial functions. That's what we just proved. Okay, so the claim is that the absolute value of f can be arbitrarily well approximated by polynomials in f. So suppose Pn, well, first of all, f is continuous and it's defined on a compact space, so its image is bounded, say, by m. That means that that function factors as x goes to minus mn, that's f, followed by the absolute value function. I mean, this could be the logarithm. I mean, well, not the logarithm if it's negative. But so take any, take any continuous function defined on the interval which is in the image, which contains the image of f. Doesn't have to be the absolute value. Any continuous function like that can be approximated by polynomials, right? So there is a sequence. P n of polynomials. With P n approaching the absolute value function in the metric space CTS minus M, MR. But composition is con a continuous function of both of the components, right? So if I have a sequence getting closer and closer to this, then the sequence of composites of those functions with F get closer and closer to the composite of that with F. That is to say, the function which is pre-composition with f is continuous. Right? I mean, 
We discussed that earlier. That was one of the basic facts about the compact open topology, and we just needed that this space was locally compact Hausdorff, which it is. Okay, so that's a continuous map, and I've got a sequence here which is getting closer and closer to the absolute value. So a continuous function sends a convergent sequence to a convergent sequence. That is to say that the sequence, which is uh, Pn circle f, converges to the absolute value circle f, which is just the function, the absolute value of f. But I claim these are polynomials in F, right? Because if for some fixed n I have that this is the polynomial a0 plus a1, let's say t, a k t k, then what does it mean? So what is Pn circle F as a continuous function on x? Well, it's the thing that substitutes f of x everywhere it sees the independent variable in Pn, which is to say a0 plus a1 f to the x plus dot 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 plus a k f to the x to the k. That is, the pn circle f is just the function a0 plus a1 f plus dot 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 a k f to the k, where I multiply functions in the usual way, right? So the product of two functions is I evaluate them and multiply their values. So therefore, there is a sequence in CTS XR of polynomials in F converging to the absolute value of F. That's a remarkable fact because Polynomials in F are sort of easily obtained from F. Those are simple things, right? The absolute value of F is not a polynomial function of F because the absolute value is not a polynomial function. But nonetheless, it, it's a limit of such things. That's what we get from the Weierstrass theorem. Okay, so the upshot is that any closed subalgebra of the function space containing f contains the absolute value of f. So subalgebra means a subset which is closed under addition of functions, closed under scalar multiplication, and closed under uh, the product of functions. And closed means closed in the compact open topology. So if it's a subalgebra and it contains f, it contains any polynomial in f because that expression is obtained from f by scalar multiplication, addition, and multiplication. All right. So a subalgebra contains all polynomials in f, and if it's closed, it contains the limit of all sequences of polynomials, and therefore it contains the absolute value of f. Uh, so that's a really neat trick, and that's the basis of the generalization, but we'll do that next time.